أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله المنتظر أرواحنا له الفداء أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد My respected elders, scholars, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'd like to begin by extending my condolences to you all on this evening of great sorrow and grief. This evening in which we have gathered to commemorate the death anniversary of the greatest of Allah's creation, Rasulullah Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And of course, based on some reports, it's also the death anniversary of the first grandson of our beloved Prophet, Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba sallallahu wa sallam hu Now, when we look at the personality of this great prophet, we find that he possessed so many great characteristics and qualities. And indeed, one majlis cannot do justice for us to examine even one of these characteristics in depth, let alone all of them. And therefore, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse I recited a few moments ago, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, is addressing the Holy Prophet, indeed you possess a great character. And it is very significant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word azim with regard to his character. Azim meaning great, instead of another word such as hasan, which means good. Because possessing a great character is very different to possessing a good character. It is at a higher level. And somebody can have a good character without necessarily having a great character. So in order to at least examine something of his brilliant personality, I've decided to focus on just one of his characteristics. This characteristic which is mentioned in the Holy Quran in a very distinctive way. And that is him being the true abd and the true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'd like to illustrate this by examining in some depth the concept of ubudiyyah and servitude in Islam. And as it was announced a few moments ago, the title therefore is Honor in Servitude, following in the example of the Holy Prophet. Because by looking at this, we will be able to get a good idea of not only his position with regard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the true abd, but also we will see that this characteristic of his of being the true servant of Allah was the most fundamental reason for his great honor. That was the main reason for him having such a great honor both in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in front of people right up until this day. And so when we say let's try and follow in his example for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he is the best example for us لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed for you in the Messenger of Allah is a good example. We will therefore be able to see how we can also, inshallah, gain honor through servitude. It is a very important concept in Islam that honor comes as a result of our great servitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When we look at traditions that describe his 
fantastic servitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can only be filled with awe and admiration for this very distinguished prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we read in the traditions that he would recite salah to the extent that his feet would swell. He would stand so long in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his feet would become swollen. Now, it is his response at such times that is very significant. When people would ask him, Oh Rasulullah, why do you pray for so long to the extent that your, sweet, your, your, your feet become swollen? His response is so, so important for us to bear in mind. He says, Afala akunu abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful servant? That's it. For him, serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was simply a matter of being grateful, of being thankful for all the blessings, all the honor that Allah had bestowed upon him. It was not servitude out of some hope of some reward in the akhirah. It was not servitude for, out of fear of some punishment that might befall the person in the akhirah. It was none of those things which, as you know, in the famous tradition from Mawla Amir, it is mentioned that these, this type of worship is either the worship of someone who's a tradesperson, like a businessman or a slave. Rather, his worship was the worship of the free person, the worship of someone who worships Allah because he deserves to be worshipped. He is worthy of worship. Afala akunu abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful servant of Allah? And this, my brothers and sisters, when we say let's follow in the example of Rasulullah, and he is this uswatun hasana for us, he is this good example for us, is a great inspiration. Because when we are faced with some acts of worship that we find onerous, and this I'm saying first and foremost to myself, and we're all different in this. Sometimes one person might find praying salah quite difficult. Another time, someone else might find fasting difficult or giving in the way of Allah in terms of khums difficult. We're all different in, in terms of what we find easy with regard to acts of worship and what we find difficult in terms of acts of worship. But then at such moments, if we can reflect and recall this statement of the Holy Prophet, that should I not be a grateful servant, then inshallah it will make our acts of worship easier to perform. That we perform them simply because Allah deserves our worship. He is worthy of our worship. And therefore we should take this stance of being a humble servant of His and just serve Him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And then with regard to even the mustahab acts of worship, of course, the example I would like to give was an act of worship which is highly recommended for us, but it was wajib for the Holy Prophet. I am of course referring to Salatul Layl. If we read the reports about the way he performed Salatul Layl, again, we would be just awestruck and we'd be full of admiration for this personality. Perhaps you know of how he used to pray Salatul Layl. Again, this is an inspiration for us. And it shows his true status of the Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he used to pray, first of all, before going to sleep, he used to bring some water and he would cover it and he would place it near the place where his head would lay. Also, he would take the miswak, that stick that they used to use for cleaning their teeth, and place it under his bed. Then he would sleep, and the narration tells us that he would not just sleep right until Fajr, for example. He would sleep till the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished him to sleep. Then he would get up. When he would get up, he would sit up, and then he would turn his eyes to the sky. When he would do that, he would recite verse 190 of Surah Ali Imran. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard waqti la fi layli wal nahar li ayatin li ulil albab. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alternation of the night and day, there are ayat, there are signs for who though? 
for those who have intellect. So, essentially, the Holy Prophet, when he would do this and recite this verse, he would contemplate, he would do tafakkur over Allah's signs. And then, it is reported, he would then go and uh, clean his teeth, do wudu, and move to the place of his salah. When he would pray his salah though, he would not pray all of those 11 raka'ah, which are the 11 raka'ah for salah to layl, at once. Rather, he would pray only four, first of all. He would pray four raka'ah of salah to layl, and in fact, it is reported that each one of his ruku and sujood would last the length it would take to recite alhamd and surah. So, you all know how long it takes to recite Alhamd and the Surah after Alhamd in the first two rakats of Salah. That's how long each one of his Ruku and Sujood would be. Until it was, it's reported that people would say, when will he raise his head? That's how long it would take him in Ruku and Sujood. Then he would go back to sleep. So he's already recited four rakaat. Then he would sleep Again, the report tells us for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished him to sleep, then he would get up. He would repeat all those things again. So he would sit up, turn his eyes towards the sky, recite uh, verse 190 of Ali Imran, then clean his teeth, do wudu, go to the place of prayer and recite another four raka'ah salah. Each time, in each raka'ah, his ruku and sujood would be those long ones, as before. So, that makes eight raka'ah altogether. A third time, he would go to sleep and wake up. He would sleep for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes him to sleep for. Wake up, do all those things again. But this time, he would not recite four raka'ah. He would recite that one raka'ah known as witr and the two raka'ah known as shafa which makes 11 raka'ah. After performing these 11 raka'ah, he would then go and he would leave his house to attend and lead Fajr prayers. This is the Salatul Layl of this great Abd of Allah. Now, the point I would like to make is that first of all, when we say that we follow in the example of the Holy Prophet, of course, this is not for us to try and emulate every single night and waking up three times and doing it exactly like he did. But at least what we can try and do is wake up at least once in the night and pray Salatul Layl. Especially at this time of the year when we wake up, when Salatul Layl and uh, Adhan of Fajr is roughly at the time when we would normally wake up for work or for school. So we can at least do it once. But the key point I would like to make with regard to his great personality is that the Holy Prophet was not only an Abd at the time when he was awake. Even his Salah, even his sleep was not the sleep of someone who is ghafil. Even his sleep was not someone who is unmindful of his relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even his sleep was the sleep of an Abd. Because a true Abd, a true servant, is always at the disposal of his mawla. Is always at the service of his master, be it daytime or nighttime. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now I'd like to examine the status of the Holy Prophet with regard to him being the true Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by examining this concept of Ubudiya in a bit more detail. Now, when we look at this concept of ubudiyya, servitude, serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, let's try and get a definition of what it involves. The lexicographers, they say, servitude and ubudiyya is simply having complete humility with obedience to a master. So, it's being completely humble with obedience to the mawla, to the master. Now, they, the scholars, they say, there are three types of ubudiyya, of servitude. And we'll see gradually how this fits in with the great character of the, of the Messenger of Allah. The first type of ubudiyya is 
the type which we are quite accustomed to hearing, especially in the olden days, and that is of slavery. Okay, so here, ubudiyya and servitude is, involves the buying and selling of slaves. The mola, the master, uses the slave for his work. But this type does not concern us for the purposes of our discussion tonight. The second type of ubudiyya is known as servitude by creation. Now, what is this servitude by creation? This refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything whether they be human beings or inanimate objects, to serve him. Now what I'd like to do is try and illustrate all of these points by, ref by referring to a verse of the Qur'an. When we look at the Qur'an, we see, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes human beings as being created in a way to serve him, and then he also describes inanimate objects, all other things, as being in that same way. First of all, with regard to human beings, well, we can point to that famous verse in Surah Rum known as the verse of Fitra, the verse of the inherent nature, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, addressing the Holy Prophet, Fa'akim wajhak liddini hanifa. So align yourself with the religion. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Fitratullahi lati fatara nasa alayha. What this second part of this verse is saying, and sometimes this is lost in English translation, but when you look at the tafasir, it explains in a very beautiful way that the first part is saying exactly the same thing as the second part. The first part, Allah is saying that align yourself with the religion, meaning this is the religion I have sent down, make sure you are acting in accordance with it. But the second part talks about the inherent nature, the fitrah. And what Allah is saying is that what I have just told you about aligning yourself with the religion is exactly what is exactly how I have created your fitra to do. So what he's saying is, I have created the fitra, the inherent nature of all mankind, in a particular way, meaning that we should try and align our inherent nature with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This means that all human beings have been created with this fitra. The fitra essentially, of course, is that pure element of the soul which everyone is born with. So everyone is born with this pure fitra. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have created in you in a way that you should align yourselves with the religion. Now, there are a couple of important conclusions we can get from this. This is one of those very important verses of the Qur'an which tells us so much about our aqidah, about our ethics, about spiritual training. The first conclusion we reach is that people who sin, right? All sinners, non-believers or even believers who slip up from time to time and commit sin. What are they doing? They are not only not conforming with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they are actually rebelling against their own selves. This is a very important conclusion we get from this, especially for my younger brothers and sisters, that sinners, they might think or they might portray an image of just being without any bounds and enjoying themselves and doing what they like, not having to do those things that we as Muslims have to do. But really what they are actually doing is that they are rebelling against their own fitra. They are rebelling against their own selves because the natural created order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that we have been created to worship Him and to be in line with His religion. Secondly, the Sharia. Often it is asked that the Sharia, why is it so difficult? Why is it so onerous for us to perform the Sharia? There's so many rules and regulations, all the wajibat we have to do, the muharramat we have to avoid. Then you have the mustahab things, you have the makru things, you have mubah things. Everything has a law. Well, this tells us, if the religion and the fitra are completely in line with one another, then surely it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not revealed anything for us to do which is over and above what we are capable of performing. It is impossible for Allah to make something wajib or haram or whatever it might be, something in the sharia, 
that we are unable to fulfill. Why? Because that would be going against the wisdom of Allah. He is saying that I have created, I have sent the religion, say for example in this particular way, I have created your fitrah to be in line with that religion. So therefore, if the sharia was something which was too difficult for us to perform, if any aspect of the sharia, let me put it this way, if any aspect of the sharia was such that it was not the best for us, it was not good for us, it would mean he has somehow legislated laws which go against our natural inclination. So when the next time we think about acts of worship, if we look at ubudiyya and servitude in this light, we will see that all of Allah's sharia, all of his divine laws and rules and regulations, they are only there for our benefit. They are, they are there for us to fulfill and be in line with his religion. Otherwise, it would go against his wisdom. He has told us to seek closeness towards him, but then he has created us in a way that we are unable to do that. And that would go against his wisdom, which is impossible. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So therefore, all aspects of the Sharia, whether it be uh, the laws relating to our private worship, Salah and Psalm and Qums and all the rest of it, or our family life, our social interactions, our financial matters, whatever it might be, they are all in line with the way he has created us. So that is with regard to human beings. What about all other things? All non-human creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have they been also created to serve him? Yes. And again, we can point to verses of the Quran. In Surah Maryam, for example, we read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In kullu man fis samawati wal ard, illa ati rahmani, Abda. There is none in the heavens and the earth except that it comes to a Rahman. It comes to the all compassionate. How, do the, how does it come? In the form, in the state of being an Abd, of being a servant. Everything has been created to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just that, but a step further. They don't only serve him. They have not only been created in this way, but they actually glorify him. For this, if we look at Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن مِن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ There is nothing, there is nothing except that it glorifies his praise, the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then how come we don't see this tasbih? How come we don't see this worship of everything serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ The verse says. However, you don't understand the tasbih. We don't have the capacity to understand the tasbih. But that doesn't mean it does not happen. It doesn't mean things have not been created in this way. So this is with regard to everything being created to serve Allah. I would like to take it even a step further. Not just with regard to them having an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also with regard to his divine guides, the prophets and the imams that Allah has sent. All of these things, whatever Allah has created, they also have an awareness of great personalities. Now this is something which is an even higher level and it requires a little bit more concentration to try and understand. But I'll try to illustrate this with regard to a story, a real story that happened at the time of that personality who we have come here to commemorate, Rasulul A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This incident concerns the pillar in Masjid al-Nabi known as the pillar of Hanana. Now many of you I'm sure have been to Masjid al-Nabi and will have seen in the area known as ar -Rawda, the garden as it's translated, just near the holy shrine of the holy prophet, there's this area known as ar -Rawda. And in that area, you will have seen many colorful pillars. And these pillars, some of them, they have labels on them. And each one of these labels refers to a story that took place at the time of the prophet's life. 
So one of these pillars is called the pillar of Hanana. Why is it called Hanana? First of all, Hanana in Arabic refers to a yearning. And it really means that when a she-camel, when a she-camel is yearning for her young one, she lets out a cry. And this is known as Hanana. So how does this relate to that pillar who, which was called the pillar of Hanana? Well, what happened was when the Holy Prophet would give his sermons, he would slightly lean on a palm tree. So what happened was as Islam began to spread more and more, the congregation started getting bigger and bigger and more and more people wanted to hear his great words and see his radiant face. So they decided to build for him a pulpit, a, a mimbar. And so when they build this mimbar, the Holy Prophet stops giving his sermon by leaning on that palm tree and he moves over to the, uh, to the mimbar to give his sermons. When he does so, this palm tree lets out a cry. It lets out a cry because of its sadness, from its separation from the Holy Prophet. Because it loved to be lent on by the Holy Prophet and it felt sad when the Holy Prophet moved away. So it lets out this cry. So the Holy Prophet, he hears this cry and he instructs for the people to bury that tree in that spot. And that is why it is known as the pillar of Hanana now, today. It's in the same spot that it, that palm tree was. So this tells us not only is everything created in a way to worship Allah, not only is everything created in a way that it glorifies Allah, but also things, they have an awareness of Allah's great divine guides because, because of their purity because of their closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other things they have an awareness of his creation sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad so now we move on to the third type of ubudiyah and servitude that is known as servitude by choice this we will see now how this fits in with the personality of rasulullah and why we say that the greatest station, the greatest honor, and the greatest title that he had was him being the true Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Servitude by choice is all about, first of all, knowing that the master deserves to be worshipped, and then worshipping him willingly through free choice. Now this, of course, only applies to beings which are created with free choice, with free will, such as human beings, such as all of us, we have free will. So, although, yes, we are created in that second category, servitude by creation, we are created in a way that we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a difference between should and actually doing. This is where our free choice comes in. We have been created to do that, but... Do we actually worship Allah or not? That is the choice we have. This is known as servitude by choice. And it is in this category that insan rises higher than any other creation. Because we have the choice to either fulfill the way that we have been created or not. We can either turn and make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy or we can rebel against Him. So, in order to illustrate this, I'd like to refer to some verses again and it's very important to bear in mind that the more somebody has this servitude by choice, the higher they rise spiritually and then the more perfect they become, the more abd they are. So it seems very straightforward. It seems very easy and logical that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that we have been created to do. This is the key conclusion that we worship Allah in the way that we have been created to do. That's what we have been created to do, to worship Him. So we choose to do that. In the words of Nabi Isa, it is so simple. He says, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbakum. Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum. Allah is my Lord 
and he is your Lord. So what is the conclusion? Fa'budu. So worship him. It's so simple. It's so straightforward and logical. He is my Lord. He is your Lord. He deserves our worship, our gratitude. And therefore, worship him. And then he goes on to say, Hada siratul mustaqim. This is the straight path. So, whenever we want to understand what is the straight path, it is nothing other than this. That we worship Allah in the way that he has created us to worship him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, I'd just like to briefly mention the opposite of servitude, especially bearing in mind that this is one of those things that we often hear about in this type of society that we live in and the definition that other people have about it, about this value. And that is the concept, the value of freedom. Okay, Because often people say and they criticize Islam, they attack Islam by saying that Islam is... It's nothing other than restrictions. It is so restrictive the way the women have to look, the way women have to wear the hijab, the way the men have to keep the beard. You have to do all of this prayer and fasting and hajj and give one-fifth of your extra earnings every year in charity. You can't eat certain things, you can't drink certain things. It's nothing but restriction. Whereas we, we are the embodiment of freedom. And we are the ones who are the lucky ones because we have this great freedom. Now, what does Islam say about this? Well, based on what we have been saying up to now, we can say that in Islam, the concept of freedom is nothing other than what we can achieve through servitude. It seems very contradictory initially when we say freedom is the same as servitude because you would think that they are the opposite. Being bound and having to act in a particular way and serving a higher authority, it seems to be something completely at odds with the concept of freedom, of not being bound. But when we look at what it means to be free, it's all about not being a prisoner. So freedom is not being a prisoner. So now I ask you, not being a prisoner of what? It's all about, according to the Islamic concept, it's all about not being a prisoner of money, of power, of social position, of the carnal desires. That is what is known as freedom in Islam. And the only way somebody can attain that freedom is through servitude. Through the servitude of Allah, they are able to break away from all of these shackles and rise spiritually. That is the true concept of freedom. And this is what we mean when we say honor in servitude. That there is honor when we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are totally free then. And I'd like to mention this with regard to that famous dua we recite every Thursday night. But I wonder if we have contemplated over this particular statement of Mawla Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatu wa salamuhu alayhi wa salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Where he says, Ya manismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa wa ta'atuhu ghinan. He says, Oh, the one whose name is a remedy, his remembrance is a cure, and his ta'a, his obedience is ghinan. It is self sufficiency. A truly beautiful statement that it is through Allah's ta'a, it is by being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we attain self-sufficiency. We attain, we attain this attribute of being ghani and self-sufficient, totally free. Of course, you all know, I just very quickly mentioned that story that I'm sure you have all heard of before, where our seventh holy Imam, Imam Musa Al-Qadhim, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi, no. wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad, when he passes that house and there's that haram music being played and there's alcohol being served in that house and there's dancing taking place. And at that time, the maidservant comes out and she puts some rubbish outside on the street there. So when the imam sees this woman coming out with this rubbish, he asks her that is the owner of this house a free man or a slave? And she replies, 
Well, surely he is a free man. So the Imam tells her a very important statement. He says to her, surely he is free because if he was a slave, he would fear Allah and he would not engage in such activities. So then when she goes inside, the owner in the tradition is, is known as Bushra ibn Haris. He asked her, what kept you so long? And she narrates the incident. I went out to put the rubbish. I met this man. He asked me, are you a free man or a slave? And I said, you are free. And he replied to me, surely he is free because if he was a slave, he would fear Allah and he would not engage in these activities. Now this got Bush ibn Harith thinking and he contemplates over this statement. And all of a sudden it dawns on him that really when the Imam said if he was a slave, he would not do these things because of his fear of Allah. It means if he was a slave of Allah, not a slave of these things, of his carnal desires, of the dunya. And so what he does is he runs outside in such a haste that he forgets to even put on his shoes. And so he is known as Al-Hafi, the barefooted one. He comes up to the Imam, he repents and he becomes a true believer. This is a story to illustrate what it means to be free in Islam. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now I'd like to gradually draw an end by just mentioning a number of examples from the Quran. These examples all concern these great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is so amazing. When I was looking through the verses, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes us to remember one of his great prophets, he always refers to them using a particular title, a particular attribute, and that is the attribute of being an abd. It is truly amazing. Let me just go through some of these verses quite quickly with you all, and you'll see how he does this, and eventually we'll come to how the Holy Prophet was honored in the Quran by being the abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With regard to Dawood, how does he want us to remember Dawood? What, does, what quality does he mention? He says, Wathkur Abdana Dawood. Remember our servant, our Abd Dawood. How about Ayyub? He says, Wathkur Abdana Ayyub. And remember our servant, Ayyub. How about prophets Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub? Wathkur Ibadana Ibrahima wa Ishaqa wa Yaqub. And remember our servants, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. How about Nabi Yusuf? He says, Innahu min ibadinal mukhlasin. Indeed, he was one of our purified servants. How about Nabi Nuh? He says, Salamun ala Nuhin fil alameen. Peace be upon Nuh. Throughout the nations, inna kathalika nadzil muhsinin. Thus indeed do we reward the virtuous, inna hu min ibadinal mu'mineen. Indeed, he was one of our faithful servants. How about Prophets Musa and Harun? Salamun ala Musa wa Harun, inna kathalika nadzil muhsinin, inna huma min ibadinal mu'mineen. How about Prophet Ilyasin? Salamun ala Ilyasin. Inna kathalika nadzil muhsinin. Inna hu min ibadinal mu'mineen. How about Zakaria? Prophet Zakaria, he says, Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu Zakaria. This is an account of your Lord's mercy on his servant Zakaria. Even with regard to Nabi Isa, it is amazing. When Nabi Isa is born, what does he say? It is quite amazing for us all to bear in mind when we say, honor in servitude. Nabi Isa, the first words he says when he is born, قَالْ inni Abdullah. He says, I, he says with pride, with honor, that I am the Abd, I am the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, when Allah wants to refer to the greatest prophet and the greatest of all of his creation. How, when he wants to refer to him with great honor and dignity and great status, how does he refer to him? 
Well, let's have a look at some of the most important incidents and events that happened in the history of Islam. And then we'll see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to his holy prophet with regard to these great incidents in the history of Islam. Well, one of the greatest incidents was the revelation of the Quran. So how does he refer to his prophet with regard to the revelation of the Quran? He says, Tabarak alladhi nazzal al-furqan ala abdeh. It's amazing. He could have said that blessed is he who revealed the Furqan, the distinction, one of the names of the Quran, upon, he could have mentioned the name of the Prophet. He could have said, Allah Rasuleh, Allah Nabiyyeh. He doesn't. He uses the word Abd. In another place, Alhamdulillahi ladhi anzala ala abdi hil kitab. All praise be to Allah, the one who revealed upon his Abd the Kitab. Instead of any other title, he chooses the word Abd. Another great incident in the history of Islam was the Mi'raj, the night journey. How does he refer to his servant? How does he refer to his prophet at such times? Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdihi Layla. Glory be to the one who took his Abd, his servant, on the night journey. And therefore we see in all of these, even the language that is used here is very significant. Subhana, Tabaraka, Alhamd. These are all words of praise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising himself. He's congratulating himself for creating such a great servant of his who was able to have the capacity to receive revelation and to go on that night journey. Because he was the greatest of Allah's creation. Before we mention a few words of Masaib, I'd just like to mention, therefore, every day in Salah, what do we say? We acknowledge the fact that the Prophet could not have been a Rasul if he wasn't, first and foremost, his Abd, Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Abduhu wa Rasulu. And I bear witness that the Holy Prophet is his servant and his rasul because without being the greatest abd of allah he could not have been the greatest rasul of allah let's all inshallah join in a prayer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we mention a few words of masaib on this very important night through the wasila of this great prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his first grandson imam hassan alayhi salam that oh allah Enable us all to follow in the example of your prophet and be one of your true servants, insha'Allah. Oh Allah, forgive us for our sins. Forgive the sins of our forefathers. Enable all of those who are in difficulty to attain relief and hasten the appearance of our 12th holy imam. Ajalallahu ta'ala farajuhu sharif. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alayka ya Rasool Allah Assalamu alayka ya Nabi Allah In the last moments of his blessed life The Prophet of Islam Became very conscious of the fact That he needed to pass on certain things To that person who was the closest to him Throughout his life and so he summons this person to come close to him. So Imam Ali, he comes close to the Prophet of Islam. When he does so, there is a private conversation that takes place between the Prophet and Mawla Amir. And then Imam Ali sits beside him until the Prophet falls asleep. When he goes out, people ask him, Oh Ali, what was it that the Prophet entrusted you? And took so long. Mawla Amir tells them that the Prophet taught me 1,000 doors of knowledge. And each one of these doors opened for me another 1,000 doors. When the Prophet's condition worsened and it became critical, he tells Imam Ali, Oh Ali, put my head in your lap. For indeed the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come. For my death now, my death is imminent. 
So the Imam Ali does this. The Prophet loses consciousness. At this point, Holy Lady Fatima, she comes to her father. She bends down to look into his face. And as she sees him in this terrible state, she starts crying and she starts calling out his name. The Prophet indicates to her to come closer. And when she does so, he whispers something to her that lightens up her face. When she goes out, the people ask her, Oh Fatima, we saw that when your father spoke to you, your face lit up. What was it that he told you? She says to them, My father told me something that removed the grief from me. He told me that I would join him very soon and that it would not take long before I joined him after his death. In his final moments, again, the Holy Prophet falls unconscious. At that point, there's a knock on the door. Lady Fatima asks who it is. From behind the door, somebody says, Ana Rajulun Gharib. I am a stranger. I've come to ask about the messenger of Allah. Do you give me permission to enter? The Holy Lady Fatima says, please go back. May Allah have mercy on you. He goes away and then he returns. But then again, he knocks on the door. And this time he says, Gharibun yastadhinu ala Rasulillah. A stranger seeks permission to enter to see the Messenger of Allah. Will you give permission to strangers? Rasulullah at this stage becomes conscious. He says, Oh Fatima, do you know who this is? Fatima replies, No, oh Messenger of Allah. He says, This is Malakul Maud. Wallahi, he has not sought permission to take anybody's soul before me, and he will never do so after me. But he does so due to the honor I have near Allah. He says to her, Grant him permission to enter. She tells Malakul Maud to come in, and as he does so, he says, As Assalamu ala ahli bayti Rasulillah. Peace be upon you, O household of the Messenger of Allah. This is the respect that the angel of death gave to the family of the Prophet. But I ask you, my brothers and sisters, contrast this. Contrast this to the situation after the death of Rasulullah. What did they do to the door of Fatima? Well, not long after the Rasulullah passed away, again, Lady Fatima hears a knocking on the door. Again, she does not give permission to enter. But this time, instead of going away, they set fire to the door. This time, they force it open. And as they do so, it strikes Lady Fatima, killing her muhsin. Allah la'anatullah ala al-qawmi zalimeen. Wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zalimu ayyamun qalibin yan qalibun. Well, sisters, we now have time for some questions and answers. Any questions from the ladies' side? Okay, we'll start with the gents. Um, Salam alaikum. Uh, I actually, there's not any question except, um, there's a question always in my mind, I've never had um, proper time to research it. This, uh, the hadith regarding how um, <coughs> the, the doors opened and hit uh, uh, the Fatima, uh, how many citations are there and, and, and it, is it well accepted? Because I know the, the, the conclusion that um, uh, Fatima was was killed by Omar is not well accepted because it's 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 like well accepted within certain Shia communities, but it's not accepted among all scholars. So there's deb debate on the on that, but there's no debate really on the on the fact that the door hits uh, as the Fatima. But 
has anyone or have you done any research to see uh, is this a authentic recitation? The reason I'm, I'm pointing that out because it's it's actually very controversial. Um, I, I had a problem with Iran uh, with with the conclusions they make with this because it's very controversial to assume that the uh, the the caliph of the time would kill the 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 the, the prophet's daughter and uh, Imam Ali would do nothing about it. So therefore, I personally don't believe in this conclusion that many Shias make. So I'm just wondering if, if you have any uh, extra <coughs> information on that, right. just little detail. On, okay. Because that, that, that <coughs> detail is significant after the Prophet's death. Yeah, it's one of those issues that requires a study of hadith in itself. Because, of course, there are lots of issues. It's not just this one. Um, there are so many issues that we hold as being true, whereas our brothers and sisters in the Sunni school of thought, they do not you know, uh, consider them as such. So it really goes down to sources and what we consider as being authentic sources, what they consider as being authentic sources. We don't accept so many things that they believe and, and vice versa. A lot of it is based on hadith because so many of our details relating to our religion, it's not in the Quran, it's based on the Sunnah, and the Sunnah, in our opinion, includes the Holy Prophet, the Holy Lady, and the 12 Imams. For them, it's very different. The Sunnah includes the sayings of the Holy Prophet and companions. So it is really, it's one of those issues that, well, which source are you going to hold as being authentic? Of course, in our sources, yes, there are. There are very good um, traditions, strong Sahih traditions about the whole incident. Um, there are lots of things, in fact, I only mentioned it briefly today, but there are many other details which are mentioned. Um, but of course, you're right, if, if you do a search, the Sunnis don't accept that. The most they say is that, yes, the Holy Lady Fatima was upset with the first Khalifa and resulting from that, the second Khalifa, mainly because of the dispute over Fadak. Uh, they come to that sort of conclusion at the most, that there was this disagreement, there was this unhappiness that she felt. Um, and it was one of those things that she never forgave, you know, the first Khalifa for. But, you know, we say there's more to it than that. Uh, are there any more questions on either side? Okay, I think we'll end there. So thank you very much, Sheikh. Salaam Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.